Uh, yeah, so I'm Mike Carson. I'm the training director for the Cedar Rapids Electrical Apprenticeship. <clears throat> we have a six county jurisdiction that we train in. Some of the other coordinators are going to talk to you, uh, cover all of eastern Iowa. Um, so um, it doesn't mean that we only work in those six counties, but uh, like we said from that trifle, that you can work anywhere in the country once you've completed uh, your apprenticeship training. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about all these apprenticeship programs is that we all work in the same conditions and circumstances. Uh, we'll work inside in the air conditioning, we'll work outside when it's 100 degrees, uh, we'll work in some of the industry plants when it's 100 degrees and 120 inside the plant. Uh, we'll work outside when it's cold, we'll work inside when it's cold. So we work in all different environments and conditions. Uh, it is physical, manual labor, uh, but uh, the brain portion of it, we can't emphasize enough. Uh, there's schooling that goes along with each one of these apprenticeship programs. Our apprenticeship program is a five-year program. Some of them are three, four, it just depends on how they fit their curriculum in in a, in a given period of time. Math and science is very important. Safety is very important. Being able to communicate clearly, take direction, uh, work independently, and uh, make uh, good progression uh, basically every day and every year of your training. Um, so they all, they're all, we all uh, work together on these job sites. Uh, we could name you several job sites where there have been, you know, 500 to 800 construction workers for two or three years. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination and communication between the people you're working with and also all the other trades as well and the engineers and the architects and the owners so it is a, a big responsibility and we want the best folks uh, in our trades uh, electrically uh, so we do everything from residential which would be the most uh, simple uh, progression of what we do most people think of light switches and outlets and things like that in a home. And that's really a very small percentage of what we do. Uh, as an inside wireman, we work on everything that's uh, industrial and commercial. So anything from a school to a university, uh, children's hospital, high rise office buildings, big box stores, uh, small uh, shopping malls, things of that nature, office buildings. And on the industrial side, most of you uh, guys and gals have seen a lot of the industry that we work in. Uh, in this area, whether it's, you know, uh, Penford, which is now Ingredient, Cargill, ADM, Quaker Oats, General Mills, um, Procter & Gamble, uh, all these different places that we also build and modify their manufacturing processes on a regular basis. So a very wide range of work that we do. Uh, electrical in those industries, you know, starts in the underground with the conduit systems for the electrical feeders and then the branch circuit systems with the panels and transformers covers fire alarms, security systems. Uh, we do green energy with uh, solar and wind, um, building automation systems, uh, programmable logic controllers, motor, motor controls, uh, a real wide range of uh, things that we do in our industry. And that's uh, one thing that attracted me uh, to our industry. Um, I am gonna uh, try and share a screen here and show some pictures. And let's see. All right, does everybody see that? Okay, so these are uh, conduit systems. They're steel conduits, and they provide physical protection for all our wiring systems. And these pictures are from the University of Iowa Children's Hospital, again, which is one of those projects that we had probably 800 construction workers on for two or three years, a uh, big project. Most job sites, you don't see different colored conduits like this. This is requested by the customer so that they could differentiate between high voltage systems, low voltage systems, life, safe, life safety critical power systems, because you know people are on life support uh, in surgery, they can't afford to lose power. Uh, so those types of things, whether it's communication between buildings at the university. So we will install anything from half inch, typically to a four inch thin wall and up to six inch thick wall so as you can see, uh, we aren't the only ones in the room. Uh, even if we were, there's a lot of different systems that we're navigating. We're using electronic blueprint systems like BIM and CAD, uh, the uh, ductwork and conduit systems and uh, plumbing and steam pipes and oxygen and all those things are all in the same room. And those all have to be coordinated uh, electronically 
And uh, so there's a lot of uh, communication, as we said, that goes on. So this was, a, this was a project where there are a ton of conduits, which means you also have at the end a ton of wires. You can see the electricians are pulling some wiring in there into these uh, big uh, 480 volt panels. And then from those uh, 480 volt panels, those will go to uh, low voltage systems with transformers. And those transformers will go down to 208, 120 volts for lights and power and critical systems. Um, and this is actually from the top of the children's hospital. So when you see the football games and everybody's uh, looking up, waving at the children's hospital, this is where the children are standing, uh, looking down on the stadium. Um, again, you can just see a lot of different conduit systems here and uh, wiring, uh, a lot of work. So uh, that's where a lot of our math um, comes in. All right, and that's enough of that one. And um, let's see, I think I have uh, another one here, pull it up. And I'll go back. Uh, so here we have um, all right. So this is the lab area in our training center. I and, can't uh, see that. Sorry. Oh, hang on. Where to get here? Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So this is the lab area of our training center and uh, we do a lot of different things down here. Uh, in the forefront there is an instrumentation trainer. So we work hand in hand with the uh, uh, pipe fitters where we're using both air pressure and electrical pressure to monitor valves and uh, temperatures and levels and uh, process systems. Uh, you can see that we've got uh, little booths there for circuitry. Um, in the back there, you'll see motor control trainers, transformer trainers. Uh, this is some equipment that you would see in an industrial setting. So we train on that. There's some more motor control uh, systems. These plants that we work in uh, will have thousands of electrical motors and they're all controlled by a separate system. A lot of them are interlocked together. Um, transformers, and that's like what I said in the children's hospital there. Typically, we have three-phase 480 volts coming into a building, and uh, then we have to manage from there down to 240 or 208, 120 is a delta system, a Y system. Um, and these are some boosts where we'll do a lot of different things, transformers, panels, conduit, uh, low voltage. So we do, we do data, we do fiber optic. Um, so we do a lot of different things, and there's some of the solar that we uh, learn how to. Um, it's not just plug and play. There are a lot of different things with the solar that determine uh, how it can be installed. We have to work with the utilities like Alliant and uh, other energy companies uh, when these are fed onto their grid system. Um, a lot of things uh, code-wise that have to take place there. Um, yeah, so you can see conduit, uh, conduit benders. Um, threading equipment, all that stuff is really expensive equipment that we use. These benders that you can see in the foreground there, those uh, are electric benders that bend our conduits. Uh, most of those are six to $8,000 a piece. You can see some fire alarm trainers in the background there. We also install and uh, maintain fire alarm systems and just kind of an overhead view of what we're doing in our lab area there. Um, so yeah, we've got a local uh, training center here. Our apprentices come to class one day a week for five hours, and they do that for 38 weeks out of the year for five years. So at the end of our apprenticeship program, our apprentices have spent about 950 hours in the classroom and over 8,000 hours on the job training uh, with the journey workers. So. What we're learning here in the training center should correspond with what they're doing in the field. And uh, so that's really how our apprenticeship program is set up to work. 
And uh, we have a lot of fun with what we're doing, but not every day is fun. Uh, it's called work for a reason. Uh, you're going to sweat. You're going to be tired. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, you have uh, room for uh, opportunity to be the foreman, the general foreman, uh, which just really adds a layer of uh, stress in most cases. Sometimes the pay isn't worth the extra stress, but nonetheless, then you're supervising everybody else that's doing the manual labor. But uh, a lot of coordination. We enjoy what we're doing. And um uh, yeah, I'll be able to answer any questions that you have when we get to the question and answer uh, center um, section of this toward the end. Oh, well, uh, I'm Chip Davis. I'm the training director for plumbers, pipe fitters, uh, refrigeration, HVACR, service techs. Um, so that's kind of a mouthful and uh, a whole lot to talk about there. Uh, I'm actually uh, I'm actually joined on this um, mobily so that I can walk through our training center and uh, kind of give you a a really fast tour uh, of this facility. Um, but uh, we, we're kind of like three different apprenticeships all under one roof with, with, uh, with what we train. And obviously there's a lot of specialization between plumbers and, and what uh, pipe fitters and what the refrigeration air conditioning guys do, do as well. I'm gonna start off in a little different direction um, before I start this tour. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go this direction with you if I can find my like, whoops, there was and it went away. So I think everybody's used to seeing that around town. And this is right out one of our office windows. That tree that was there um, was approximately uh, uh, three and a half foot diameter. And that tree fell straight over on this building. Um, and we are just now getting this building put back together. Um, when that tree fell over on the building, it not only uh, damaged the building, but it also broke a, uh, a fire sprinkler line. So if the rain and, and everything else from the storm coming in didn't do enough damage, uh, we flooded the building with, with the fire sprinkler. Um, so we had a lot of water damage. And I was hoping to be able to show you a little bit more of this. Um, but uh, a few weeks ago, um, the carpenters had torn out these cabinets. A lot of the sheetrock had to be torn out. Um, a lot of the electrical had to be redone. Um, all of the ceiling grid in here was out. Um, so the, the lights had to come out. Up above the ceiling grid is where the, where the tree had hit, which meant the iron workers were here uh, taking the sheet metal off. The roofers were here taking the roof off. Um, the iron workers had to replace some of the structurals. Um, they had to replace uh, um, the sheet metal. Um, the roofers had to redo the roof. And obviously once we got into the inside, um, lots going on here. So um, our training center has got some construction of its own going on right now. Um, as you can see, this is uh, part of our main offices that got flooded and and uh, is actually getting back together now. Um, while we're having this done, the carpenters uh, are cutting a new window in for us right there. So um, a new window is going into the uh, right here into this office to the outside. But obviously the uh, they're getting close to a point where the uh, tile setters will be coming in to set the tile on the flooring and, and finish things up. But I thought I'd show you that to start off. So we're gonna head back through our training center here quick and let you see, uh, let you see some of these shops and see what's going on. Obviously that's a computer lab, right? Our, our training centers are all schools. So um, there's a lot of similarities to what you're used to seeing right now. And uh, I'm gonna take you back here first to our medical gas room. So uh, Mike had mentioned to you Children's Hospital. Um, besides uh, what I'm gonna to talk to you about what plumbers, pipe fitters and refrigeration HVAC service techs do, um, one of the certifications they can get is medical gas piping installation. So what you're seeing here is where we, we hook up um, cylinder gas supplies and medical surgical um, air and medical surgical vacuum. Um, basically everything that you would see in a hospital facility and most of you are used to seeing the stations at, uh, at the nurses stations and, and seeing these zone valve boxes in the hallways that mean absolutely nothing and you don't know what's going on. But here you can see um, all the piping that's in the walls. Uh, this is a certification that's required to install all of these systems so that um, you can have all those outlets. In, in the rooms that you're, that you're used to seeing. So 
that's kind of what this looks like in the walls. So anyway, um, parts that you don't normally see that, that require a lot, um, a lot of uh, very detailed work installing all of this. So uh, Mike mentioned Children's Hospital and the number of people on that job. Uh, Modern Piping is one of our contractors that did that for us. And I believe between plumbers, pipe fitters, and uh, the uh, uh, refrigeration HVAC service guys, I think at one time um, that one contractor had eight people on that job site. So I'm gonna keep going here. And we're gonna see what's going on in some of the shops. So I'll, I'll walk in here. This is a mechanical lab and classroom. Looks like what these guys are working on right now is um, actually pump alignment where they're learning how to line up uh, the pumps to the motors that drive them for whatever the pumps are running, probably a hydronic heating or cooling system. So if the uh, pump and motor isn't aligned perfectly, the coupler in between will get torn out. So that's part of the training they're working on right now. But as you can see, that um, this is classes that all of our apprentices take, whether they're a plumber or pipe fitter. Um, right here, you're seeing uh, boiler and hydronic heating system. Um, boiler and what would be an in-floor heating system, a snow melt system, lots of different, uh, different types of heating systems. And to keep moving, I'm trying to move fast here because there's a lot, a lot to show you. Obviously, uh, steam boilers and steam piping systems. The steam is used for uh, many things besides product. Uh, steam's used for heating, steam's used for running different equipment. Chip, we lost your video. Did you turn off your video? Hold on. I'm not sure what I just had happen here. There we go. All right. So I walked into the plumbing shop um, and lots of stuff going on in here too. Looks like there's some book work going on right now, but all of this piping overhead here is piping, drainage piping that would be um, above a ceiling. Um, that would all be drainage piping that's installed for uh, bathrooms that would be on the next floor up. Um, so this particular group is working on, looks like they're working on some uh, drawings, um, some of the drawings and, and uh, blueprint associated with putting in all this type of piping. Actually, uh, the video you saw at the beginning um, one of the apprentices that was talking in that video uh, is in this class. Yeah, he's sitting over there at the table. Uh, he's in this class this week, and he's got about four months to go before he's done with his apprenticeship. Yeah, these guys are these guys are running a camera down a uh, floor drain um, to look and see what's causing any issues with that floor drain. These are all backflow devices and other certification uh, to protect the potable water system. Lots of stuff to see in here. I'm gonna keep moving before I run out of time. So I mentioned the HVAC refrigeration service text. We're gonna go into the HVAC lab. And here we're gonna see a huge amount of different things going on as well. So these guys work on heating and cooling systems. Um, they work on all types of refrigeration equipment. So um, a lot of different things to see in here. Um, I'll come back and take a look at the project they're working on too, but uh, that's a rooftop unit that you might see on your favorite restaurant or convenience store that heats or cools the, heats or cools the facility. Um, you know, here's a furnace and condensing unit that would heat or cool your house. So any type of heating or cooling system, um, we actually have uh, heat pump systems um, for heating and cooling um, the shops and classrooms. So our heating and cooling systems in this building are actually part of our training systems that the apprentices work on too. 
uh, advanced refrigeration systems. This would be a uh, rack system that you would see running uh, grocery store cabinets, freezers, that type of equipment. It's a walk-in cooler, walk-in freezer. So just about every type of heating or cooling system you can think of. Um, these guys are building their own project this week. And uh, what's going on right here is they took the components out of a drinking fountain and uh, reconfigured everything and hooked it all up. And they made a little coil in the top of this end table. And they're freezing the water in the top of the top of the end table to make a uh, frozen tabletop that you could set drinks on and, and keep them cool. But this all started out life as components out of a drinking fountain and, and uh, just a project that they're working on in class. So again, I gotta keep, keep moving, lots of stuff to see. Uh, piping systems that are, would be above the ceiling you wouldn't see in our building here. So now I'm gonna head back to the weld shop. Um, all of our, I don't have any classes going on back here this week, but um, take you back in through here anyway. All of our apprentices, whether they're plumbers, pipe fitters, refrigeration, HVAC service techs, um, end up taking some weld classes. Obviously the pipe fitters take a lot more weld classes than uh, the rest do. Um, pipe fitters predominantly work on industrial piping systems, um, whether that's uh, process piping, it could be uh, thin wall stainless at General Mills that's got frosting going through it. It could be heavy wall piping at a powerhouse that's got high pressure steam going through it. Uh, piping like, like you see on the structure, um, that's all work that pipe fitters do, process piping. So weld shop, weld booze, um, kind of trying to keep going here so I can show you different things. So we talk about, um, every, every time I ask what's a pipe fitter do, someone says fits pipe. Well, so here's the answer to fits pipe. Um, here's why all of our trades say uh, there's a lot of basics that go behind construction. Um, these are trainers where apprentices will get a drawing that tells them they have to go from one flange to another, what degree offset they have to run. They start out with 90 degree fittings, they fabricate their pieces in a stand and have to bring them over and have to bolt up and fit. So that means they have to cut fittings down. 90 degree fittings to make the right degree of fittings and do all the math um, to calculate all this out. So just one more piece of what pipe fitters do. Um, gosh, I walked right past that. So tubing, um, likewise, have to bend tubing for different, uh, different systems, whether it's pneumatic systems that, that are control systems or tubing that's being used as part of a process or product as well. So, um, how am I doing on time? About a minute. Okay. Trying to run through here quick and catch as much as I can. Um, so real quick, I will take you into here. So this is a classroom in a weld shop. Um, just to show you a couple of things quick. I mentioned the uh, food grade stainless. Um, so that would be something like this. Um, these would be welds that are made with a automatic welding machine where um, the welder has to write the program for the machine, um, test the program, actually certify the welds to make high quality, high purity welds for whatever the product is. So that's one direction. Um, and this would be an example of some of the heavy wall piping I was talking about. You can see that that's about two and a half inch thick piping. Um, so it takes a considerable amount of time to weld out each joint with something like that. Um, that'd be used on 
on uh, something like high pressure steam at a powerhouse. So there, a whole lot, a whole lot of information really fast. Switch this right. back around. Whole lot of information really fast. Um, so obviously plumbers work on uh, waste piping like you saw in the shop over there, water piping, um, installing all the fixtures, working on all those fixtures. Uh, pipe fitters work on predominantly in industrial piping, process piping. Um, because the bulk of the systems that pipe fitters work on are, are either um, high pressure systems or have uh, purity requirements, the bulk of the systems that pipe fitters work on are usually welded piping systems where uh, the plumbers may have uh, a whole bunch of other different pipe joining techniques that they use more frequently. So um, there's your there's your quick tour. Awesome. Thanks, Chip. So the Carpenter's Apprenticeship. My name is John Delaney and I'm the training coordinator here at the Apprenticeship. Um, you might think a carpenter is someone who primarily works with wood, frames houses, builds cabinets, um, maybe even, um, you know, some intricate furniture or something like that. And where that's true, um, carpenters do work with, uh, do a lot of woodworking. Um, and you might also realize through watching uh, some of these uh do-it-yourself home shows that are on TV. Um, you know that a carpenter walks into a house and he might say, uh, well, here's, uh, here's a wall I'm gonna knock out and I'm gonna add some cabinets and a sliding glass door over there um, and maybe some uh, a fireplace on the other side. But, uh, and when I come back from commercial break, all the work's done, nobody got dirty and I just made $20,000 flipping a house. Um, don't watch those shows. They're not real. It's not true. Um, carpenters really do get down in the dirt. They work hard. They sweat. They get dirty. Um, and that's a part of life in the building trades. But carpenters do so much more than what people realize. We like to call ourselves um, one trade, many crafts or many careers. And uh, where a carpenter starts out on a job site, if you can imagine your school or, or a large building uh, before it's even constructed, um, that building has to be laid out on the ground and oriented in such a fashion um, that we consider property lines, um, utilities, roadways, that sort of thing. So we're gonna take all of our information off from um, our blueprints or our vision that the, the architect and the um, engineers gave us. And then we're going to transfer that information onto the ground using tools, uh, layout tools we'll call them, such as a total station um, or laser total stations. Uh, we're looking at a, um, a, a, I, I want to say a, a, a larger total station. You might have seen these on the side of the road. Uh, someone looking through one of these, uh, determining different elevations. But we're going to actually paint on the ground where that building sits. And then we're going to call uh, our friends, the operating engineers. They're going to come in dig a big hole in the ground for us. And uh, in that hole, we're gonna put our foundation. So the car carpenter's responsible for climbing down in that hole, laying out again the foundation, which is generally made from concrete. Only we can't just back the concrete truck up and into that hole, right? Because you know, concrete's wet when it comes out of the truck and it's gonna, run around and make a big mess. So we actually have to build forms to contain that concrete. And those forms might be something small, like you see in front of us, four feet high, eight inches wide, or there might be two or three feet wide, 100 feet long, 25 feet tall, um, and then turn a corner and then incorporate a radius wall into that concrete system 
in which case we would have to know uh, how to plot points along an arc and we would have to know how to determine the volume of that concrete form so that when we order concrete we're not ordering too much concrete or too little concrete because it is very very expensive as you know um, and then on top of those concrete walls or that foundation uh, something really cool is going to take place now we're going to give shape to our building and our building um, is a little bit different from say your house in commercial construction um, instead of using two by four or two by six lumber to frame our building we're going to use steel studs and drywall or gypsum board product. And um, if you think about the advantages that steel might have, you're seeing an actual radius wall where we've bent those steel plates uh, to incorporate that radius. And if you try bending a two by four or two by six, um, you know that it's gonna break. And, uh, and if you can do it, you're more of a man than I am as well. Excuse me. But anyways, uh, there's a lot of other advantages to using steel studs as opposed to um, the lumber. Um, first of all, it's 93% it's recyclable or more. In other words, we might be using your grandfather's old Buick right now for building components. Um, and, but the primary reason that we like to use steel studs in our industry is um, if there is a large fire in a building with a lot of people in it, we like to give them as much time as we can to get out of the building. Now we refer to that time as our fire rating. And if you think about a, a steel stud, if you throw that on a fire, you're not gonna get a whole lot of heat out of it. So uh, our fire rating is very important to us. If our walls are fire rated, then so too must all our penetrations be fire rated, such as our doors and door frames like you see here. Now, if you think about a door in your house or your bedroom even, uh, you know that you can go to a uh, apartment store or hardware store and for $100 or less, you can put a door in your house and um, maybe even for another 50 bucks, you can get a lock set or a handle uh, up for that door. And $150, less than $200, you can have a good looking door. <clears throat> However, if that door is fire rated and because of all the commercial hardware, the door, the hardware, the hinges, the lock set, closer, kick plates, everything else, that raises the price to about $1,200 a door. Now, if you think about your school and how many doors are in that school, that's a lot of money. Now, if you're a client who wants a building built, wouldn't you feel more comfortable having someone who is skilled and trained to put in these doors in windows and all that commercial hardware uh, because uh, one hole drilled out of place, one misplaced piece of hardware, and you've just ruined that $1,200 door. Uh, so carpenters are responsible uh, for not just uh, the foundation, the walls, the doors, the hardware, the drywall used to cover up everything. Um, Carpenters are also responsible for very intricate finish work, like we did talk about earlier, the cabinets, the base, the molding, the trim, that sort of thing. Um, carpenters are also responsible for uh, ceiling installation as well. Um, and then you see here a, a, set of, a small set of scaffolding. Now scaffolding you might have seen on the outside of buildings. Uh, it's a series of elevated platforms uh, for a lot of other trades to work on. And we are responsible for not only designing and building that scaffold, but up to 125 feet. 
which is very high off the off the ground. If you're the type of person that likes those working at extreme heights and is comfortable with that, you're more than welcome to apply. Uh, that's not my sort of thing, um, but carpenters do build a lot of scaffold as well. Uh, behind the scaffold, you saw the rafter systems we had. Um, we also teach how to mathematically design rafters and then cut them out as well to support our roofing system. So there is so much more than what we realize about what a carpenter does uh, than what I can tell you about in just a few minutes. But uh, I really appreciate you watching us today. And I would encourage you that if you do have more questions later on, or if you want to visit our, our site, um, please check us out at www.carpentersunionapprenticeship.com. You can contact us, come out and, and visit our, our facility, and we'd love to have you. All right. Thank you so much, John. We too, much like um, all the other trades that have spoken before me, we have several trades under our umbrella as well. Uh, we have bricklayers. Uh, they lay brick, block, and stone. They build schools, malls, hospitals, clinics, like that. Build the structure and the uh, something nice on the outside of it, brick, appealing. Uh, but we also have some other trades that we we train for here in our training center. We uh, we have what's called PCC, which is pointing, caulking, and cleaning. So um, the pointers, they go in and they do uh, restoration. We have historic preservation specialists. We have uh, all sorts of training that we do under that umbrella, uh, teaching you how to match mortars and, and material, you know, uh, different uh, historic uh, techniques that might be used to uh, build a particular type of building or with a particular type of material. Uh, and then we have uh, caulkers. Caulkers go in and they put sealants around penetrations in buildings, windows, doors, uh, things like that. They will also seal concrete uh, expansion and control joints. They'll um, do the same thing on the exterior buildings. Uh, we also have uh, cleaners and cleaners come in and they will clean up the material after the bricklayers get done building a building. There'll be uh, mortar residue and things like that that are left on the building. Uh, the cleaners come in and they will uh, clean that up using a variety of methods. They'll use chemical treatments like types of acids. They'll also use uh, physical tre treatments where they might use a sandblaster or things like that. Uh, and, and the, the uh, uh, new equipment. There was a building in downtown Des Moines that uh, was built out of limestone back in the eight, uh, early 1900s. And uh, the limestone attracts carbon from uh, the emissions from vehicles because it, it is uh, a carbon magnet. And <clears throat> as that stone gets darker and darker, they have to go in and clean it. And they've found that lasers will burn that carbon off of the limestone very nicely. So this company went in and they had eight inch lasers that they would go over the entire building with and they burned off all of that black uh, carbon deposit. Um, so that's PCC. We also do some uh, concrete work and we also do some tile and that's all under our umbrella. Um, so what we have going on here today, uh, I'm at our training center. We cover the, the whole state of Iowa except for Scott County where the Quad Cities are and 14 counties around Omaha. Uh, but the rest of the state is ours. Uh, and what we have, our apprenticeship program is four years long uh, and we bring in kids uh, not just kids, uh, we bring in what we call pre-jobs uh, once a year and we begin to develop some skills. We teach them how to spread mortar and how to lay brick and block uh, and get them to the point where they can call themselves bricklayers. And then we send them out into the field. Well, that pre-job class uh, 
is going on right now. Uh, we have a class of 12 uh, that started the uh, 8th of March, and they'll be complete here at the end of April, and they'll be uh, heading out into the field. We also have some of our third year apprentices in here, and they're, uh, they're in class doing OSHA 30, so I'm not going to disturb them, but I'm going to turn my camera around so you can I'll start showing you some of what we are doing here. So uh, those are our third year apprentices in the classroom there. They're, uh, they're learning OSHA 30. Uh, but out here we have uh, some of our pre-job students. Uh, and like I said, they're just beginning to learn uh, the skills of spread and mortar and lay and brick. Uh, I thought we might talk to one of them and see uh, why he chose masonry. Sorry? Yeah, do you think you could tell us? I'm talking to some high school oh, uh, awesome. students, and I was wondering if you could tell us why you chose masonry, and do you, are you enjoying what you're doing? Uh, right now, I am enjoying yeah. uh, I chose masonry because last fall I went to the uh, high school open house uh, with, with my high school. I just graduated this past year, and I was pretty all right at it, and I enjoyed it because I always like doing something with my hands. And I like the order that everything goes in. So now I'm able to see how it should be and how it knows it has to be in order to look nice. Right. So I just enjoyed it and I wanted to see my hands. So, I don't know. Great. I like it, so. Thank you. Yeah. You can see what we, we start them out. We try to teach them how to, uh, the very first part of our job is spreading the mortar to put the units on. And so we got to make sure that they know how to do that correctly. And then the next step in the process is making sure that they know how to lay the units correctly. And then after that, we'll teach them how to use a level and how to independently build walls without using a string line. As you can see here, we, we use a string line across the wall to, to make sure that our units get placed correctly, height and in and out. Uh, and it's a matter of learning how to see where that brick goes and pushing it the right amount down. Uh, I'm gonna have one of my instructors here talk to you for a second. Um, this is Jake Wignall. He's an instructor for BAC3. Uh, Jake, you wanna maybe tell some people why you're a bricklayer and maybe one of your favorite projects or something you really enjoyed working on? I'm a bricklayer at the end of the day. You're going to see what you accomplished. It's basically art, and it'll be there long after I'm I'm done. So probably my favorite project that I worked on is uh, the sculpture downtown for the I just can't even remember the name. In the park downtown Des Moines, uh, it's the big black ball, right? It's uh, like two offset cuts. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, it, that was a beautiful project. Uh, pretty cool that you got to work on that, right? Uh, that's one of the things about what we do, right? Is that occasionally we get to work on some really neat projects. I I worked on the uh, the old uh, Capitol in Iowa City. Uh, there was some restoration work that happened there. That that was one of the cooler projects I've been on as well. Uh, How are the job doing? The pre jobs are coming along a lot better than I thought. There's different skill levels, some that have worked as a labor or mason support out in the field. The ones that are just learning here without right. any experience. Right. Some of these guys came in with zero experience, and we, we will bring you up from the, the very bottom uh, and teach you everything you need to know. Well, thanks, Jake. So, trying to turn my camera around here. Uh, that's a little bit about what we do. Like I said, we also train uh, caulkers and pointers and that all happens here as well. We also uh, <clears throat> really strive like all of these trades do to uh, you know, do our job right. Uh, we all make a very good living. Uh, we get paid well to do what we do. 
But the reason that we get paid well to do what we do is because we are trained professionals. We, uh, you know, we, we, I have people all the time that ask me, do you want it done fast or do you want it done right? And my answer is always both. Uh, we should be able to do it quickly and we should be able to do it correctly. Uh, and that's what this training is all for, right? Uh, is to train these people to, to be the best at what they do so that they can command the wage that they're gonna earn when they leave here. Uh, so like John mentioned, you know, uh, no matter what trade you choose, there's gonna be some hard work involved. Uh, you know, we are a very hard work. So, you know, uh, but those of us that do this really enjoy that. Uh, I love being a bricklayer. Player, I love, you know, leaving a product behind that, um, you know, we, I can be proud of, that I can tell my kids that I built, uh, you know, that I get joy out of seeing when I drive by, uh, you know, just remembering what it took to put that building together and uh, what, what we went through as a team uh, to put that up, you know, and, and like Mike and, and John and everybody said, you know, we're, we're all intri intricately related, you know, the, the plumbers need the, elect or the electrician, the plumbers need the electricians and the carpenters need, a, you know, we all play off of each other. Uh, and we are one big team uh, at the end of the day. And, you know, even here, just the bricklayers on a job, we, we all try to work as a team. The job gets done quicker. Uh, and uh, usually better and safer, like Mike said, you know, safety is our number one priority. We want to make sure you all go home at night, uh, which you might not find at your Uncle Timmy's uh, construction company or wherever you might go to work. Uh, but here, we're going to make sure that you go home at night, that you get paid well, and that you know what you're doing. Uh, my name is Seth Norman. I'm here with the uh, iron workers. Um, what we have to offer is a three-year apprenticeship. Um, what we like to do is uh, structural steel. So if anybody's seen the people up on the beam, um, big famous picture, that's set in structural steel. Um, in a second here, we'll show you around the shop a little bit and show you exactly what we do here um, for our training. But uh, we are a three-year apprenticeship. Um, like Mike and everybody said, earn as you learn. Um, at no cost to you. Um, but going, going forward, we also put rebar in uh, concrete. We set in place. Uh, we also do metal buildings. Um, if anybody doesn't know what that is, it's like a uh, pole shed, but it's got metal framing instead of wood. Um, we also do windmills, build roller coasters, set window wall units. Um, we don't actually set the panes in, but we do set the whole unit. Um, heavy rigging, and we uh, set and dismantle cranes, uh, tower cranes, that type of stuff. So that kind of gives you an idea of what an iron worker does. If you, if you look down the list and you see all these different trades, you notice one thing that the iron worker sticks out. And I just got to poke a little bit at the other trades that iron workers has work in the name and it's hard work. So you might see a couple of the other guys laughing a little bit because they know it's true. But uh, like I said, I do want to show you around a little bit to, to our training center. And let me try to flip this around. Alrighty. So as you can see, here's a little model of uh, rebar. As you seen earlier, they're talking about uh, the carpenters were talking about um, forming up concrete stuff like that. Well, there's reinforcing that needs to go in it, and we're the ones that actually place and set that. So this is just a little a little model of uh, what it might look like on the job. Like right around here, you have the uh, uh, forms, and then here would be the rebar. I'm kind of going around. We also do quite a bit of welding. So we have roughly 18 welding booths on the front and the back side of this. We actually got uh, our first year class. I don't know if you can kind of see them shuffling through there. 
Um, they're actually going out to tie some rebar now. They're in rebar class. But this is our shop. Um, right here, you kind of see a, a burning and cutting table. Um, in the background, you can kind of see that we have some lifts. We do all of our own lift training. Um, and over here, we have some more models. So this would be like a little mock-up of a little hospital. So if you can kind of see all the beams and everything on here, that's what iron workers do. They put up the structural steel part of things. So kind of looking around right here, you got a little welder. If you look really closely, you got a little guy right there. He's up on an elevator shaft. And kind of moving, kind of the same thing. This was uh, our a member makes these for us. And this was based off of the children's hospital. Not, all, not a replica or nothing, but a lot of the features. So he worked on that and kind of made the same thing. So I'm going to go around the table real quick. All right. And if we kind of look here, we got, we got some rebar that was placed in for a sidewalk. We also have a little little walkway, cantilevers out, and got metal roof deck. This is what goes on before the roofers put the the insulation and the uh, rubber membrane over the roof. All right, and then here we have another form of a building. This is precast building. So if we kind of look at these little panels right here, that is a, a, just a cement panel. What it happens is it comes in on a semi truck and we pick it up with a crane, tilt it up into place and set it. And what we use is these little poles to kind of plumb it up. And then from there, we, we start welding. And then from there, you can kind of see the different bar joists. That's these little things right here. And that's what's going to hold the roof on. So this would be a beam bar joist job, but with precast. So the precast being like a lot of schools are this way, um, just a nice cement facade. All right, now going, we're going to walk out a little bit so I can kind of show you our, our backyard. All right, we got some kids out there. They're tying rebar right now. Now back here, we also have a 40 by 60 building that we put up. It's 21 foot tall. We put it up and take it back down along with a metal building, like I said earlier. You can kind of see the metal building over in this area. But here we got some apprentices and they're making a, a beam right now. This would go in the concrete and that's what gives it all of its support. So maybe they might wave at you guys. Can you guys wave? All right. All righty. So sorry for the the moving around a lot. But it kind of shows you a little bit about our trade. Um, there's a lot more. Let's see if I can get it in your in our thing. If you can kind of see behind me, there's a big, big, huge beam right here in the air. That's what we call a column. Um, in our apprenticeship, we do have a competition um, because we are very competitive. Um, that's a 35 foot tall column. And what we like to do is we like to climb it. We also do welding in our competition, um, layout, that type of stuff. You gotta watch out real quick. Yeah. Using equipment as we speak right now. Sorry, it's kind of loud. All right, but uh, other than that, um, just kind of want to let you know uh, some things like why I got the trade. Um, I just did not know where I wanted to end up in life, where I wanted to end up. Um, and one thing is, is 
I knew with this, I would, I would always have a place to go because like you heard earlier, you can travel anywhere throughout the United States. Um, a lot of them go up into Canada and other places. So no matter where I moved to, I had a place. And once I was taught this trade, I didn't need to know anything else. Um, an iron worker, that, that, that's all I know. That's all I, that's all I can do. And I can go anywhere throughout the United States and do it and make good money doing it.